Welcome back, my friends, to the Finding Financial Freedom podcast. This is episode five, and today we'll be diving into baby step three. But before we get started, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors. This episode is sponsored by Pearson Rabbits. Pearson Rabbits' story begins with Dr. Stephanie Pearson, a passionate ob at the height of her career. But then a shoulder injury struck and her dreams were shattered, leaving her unable to practice medicine. Determined to make a difference, Stephanie became an advocate for her peers, guiding them through the complex disability claims process. Alongside insurance expert Scott Rabbits, Stephanie founded Pearson Rabbits, a company that does insurance differently. Together, they empower healthcare professionals to protect their most valuable asset, their income, and their most important people, their family. Life can change in an instant. It's hard to imagine that a sudden illness or injury could leave you and your family in a devastating financial situation. But with a little planning, you can prepare for every possibility. Visit PearsonRabbits.com today and secure the safety you need for every twist and turn in life's journey. Last week, we went over baby step one and two. Baby step one was to protect. Before doing anything else, we're going to make sure we get our insurances in place and write a will and designate beneficiaries in all our accounts so we can make sure those that count on us will be taken care of if anything happens to us. Baby step two was to save a starter emergency fund. This is the larger of $10,000 or the amount of our highest deductible. It's important to get this measure of protection in place because life happens, emergencies happen. An emergency fund keeps us from going farther into debt when those emergencies happen. Now it's time to move on to step three, start investing and game plan student loans. First, let's talk about why it's so important to start investing now instead of later. The short answer is compound interest. Compound interest is often called the eighth wonder of the world. If you've had student loans prior to 2020, you've experienced it working against you. When unpaid interest accumulates and then adds to principal and then continues to accrue more interest going forward, that's called negative amortization. This is the reason student loan balances often go up even when someone is making regular payments. Compound interest is when that power of interest on interest works for you instead of against you. The principal you invest earns interest, which then adds to the principal and starts earning even more interest the next month and so forth. Thus, our money grows not in a linear fashion, but in an exponential fashion. For example, if you invested $2,000 per month for 35 years and earned an average of 5% interest, what would happen? With simple interest, we'd multiply $2,000 a month times 35 years times 1.05 to get $882,000. But with compounding interest, the time in years now goes in the exponential location to yield a total of over $2 million. The difference between the contributions and the value of the account really starts to take off after 10 years or so. If you've lived through COVID and the pandemic, you know what an exponential growth curve looks like. Remember when the numbers were just petering along for a while and all of a sudden they just took off? That's exponential growth. And the same can happen to your money. That's why it's so important to start investing now because compounding takes time to reach that critical mass for exponential growth. And we have already lost a decade of investing as compared to our non-medical peers because we were in training. That process of your principal earning interest and then adding to the principal and earning even more interest going forward is a very very powerful mathematical money strategy. So go ahead and take a few moments to mess around with a compound interest calculator. There's a good one at investor.gov. This calculator may change your life. Assume an average rate of investment return is 7% and 10% is above average. This process may literally change your life because it really brings to the forefront how powerful saving and investing can be. Another rule to be aware of is the rule of 72. The rule of 72 can show you how many years it'll take for your investment to double, given an annual interest rate. So you simply divide 72 by your annual interest rate to approximate how many years it'll take to double the value of your investment. So if you're earning a 10% average return, it will take you 72 divided by 10, which is 7.2 years for your money to double. 
You may be asking, how much money do we need to be financially independent? There are two ways to look at this. If we're investing in stocks and bonds, first we'll need to know how much money we need to live on every year. And then we take that number and multiply it by 25. So someone is spending $100,000 a year, for example, and that person would need $2.5 million to be financially independent, $100,000 times 25. Someone spending $200,000 a year would need $5 million to be financially independent. This is a widely used rule of thumb by the financial community based on the 4% rule. The 4% rule is derived from the Trinity study conducted by William Benjen et al. in 1994. It looked at safe withdrawal rates for portfolios that grow and shrink irregularly over time with the goal of only drawing off interest and making the pot of money last for a 30-year retirement. The period of study was from 1925 to 1995. They determined that the average rate of growth for a portfolio was 7%. So a withdrawal rate of 3 to 4% would be very likely to make a portfolio last beyond 30 years, accounting 3% for average inflation. While this calculation has many limitations, because it doesn't account for taxes or adjustments in spending during low times, it is a rule of thumb to estimate how much money we need to save to be financially independent. Speaking of taxes, let's talk about where to invest. Most financial experts will tell you to fill up your retirement accounts with investments first. Why? Because it is literally the biggest tax break you'll get as a high-income professional. To understand what a big deal this is, first you have to know how you get taxed if you invest in a regular brokerage account that's fully taxable. So first you get taxed on the income that you make by working. Then you take whatever's left at the end of the month and put that in a brokerage account. So that money has already been taxed once. Then the money grows in your investments and you'll pay taxes on the dividends. Dividends are payments made from businesses to shareholders periodically. Ordinary dividends are taxed at your regular income tax rate, which is all the way up to 37%. Qualified dividends are from companies that the IRS has decided that get a lower long-term capital gains tax rate because they are favorable somehow. So anyway, you get taxed as your investments grow. Then, say you decide to sell your investment and spend your money. Then you'll pay capital gains tax. Capital gains are the difference between the sale price and the cost basis, or the price that you originally bought your investment for. If you held the investment for longer than a year, you'll pay the more favorable long-term capital gains tax, which is 15%, Unless your family makes less than $80,000 a year, then it's 0%. Or if you make more than $496,000, it's currently at 20%. Anyway, you can see that you'll pay a lot of taxes. Long-term capital gains are favorable to short-term capital gains, but there are still taxes that you have to pay. So a doctor making, say, $200,000 in a W-2 income is already paying a ton of taxes. Federal tax for that doc is $24,000. FICA tax is $15,300. Local and state taxes can be anywhere from 4 to 9%, depending on the doctor's location. So that doc can be paying up to $60,000 in taxes a year already. The IRS has decided to reward retirement saving by letting people in all income brackets take a tax break for investing for retirement. They do this by letting you put up to $22,500 in 2023 as an employee contribution into your 401k or 403b tax-free. Remember, this limit does change every year. It usually goes up adjusted to inflation. So the doc in our example, making $200,000 a year, would only be taxed on $177,500 if he maxed out his retirement account. So that's how traditional or pre-tax contribution works. The IRS gives you a tax break, doesn't tax you on that $22,500 if you put it into your retirement account. And that lowers your taxable income. Not only that, the IRS also lets the investments in these accounts grow tax-free. So no paying taxes on dividends in these accounts. Once a doc reaches a retirement age and starts selling these investments, the taxman will collect. At that time, the doc will likely be in a lower tax bracket, so the calculation and determination that you're making when you make pre-tax contributions is that you're likely going to be in a higher tax bracket when you're earning income than when you're retired. If the opposite is true and you think you're going to be in a high tax bracket when you're retiring as well, a Roth contribution might be the choice that you want to go for. 
The other option is to contribute to our accounts in a Roth fashion. That means we choose to pay taxes on our income now. So this doc would still show $200,000 in income on her end-of-the-year tax return, but her contributions would still grow tax-free, and then they would not be taxed when she started withdrawing. Another benefit of Roth contributions to 401ks after the Secure 2.0 Act is that Roth money will also have no required minimum distributions. So these contributions could continue to grow tax-free even after this doc reaches retirement age. If she didn't want to withdraw them, she could continue to let that money sit there and grow. But I digress. The point is that the government is incentivizing saving for retirement so you can be financially solvent as a retiree. It makes sense to start investing here. The question during our debt payoff journey is really how much? Should we fill the retirement accounts first or hold off on retirement investing until debts are paid off? This is really a tough question. Dave Ramsey recommends holding off on retirement investing until all debt is paid off. That's not smart for doctors, for sure. Not only are we already behind in retirement savings, most employers also offer an employer match. So if you contribute to your retirement account, they'll put a percentage into your retirement account for you too. Not getting this match is basically leaving compensation on the table. So during our debt payoff journey, we should be at least investing enough to get the maximum employer match. After that, the question is, should we max out the retirement account? There's no prescriptive answer to this question. This is something you must determine based on your family's situation. The fact is that if that $22,500 of tax-free space is not used up in the tax year, it does not come back. Use it or lose it. You can't go back and backfill employee contributions into a 401k or 403b after the tax year has ended. During our loan payoff, Josh and I didn't max our retirement accounts for one year. This is not really an option for us because I had changed jobs and wasn't eligible to contribute for my new employer's 401k yet, and Josh hadn't started working yet. The second year, the student loans were paid off in April, so we were able to use the rest of the year to max out the retirement accounts for that year. So it really depends on your situation. Ideally, you would fill the retirement accounts to the maximum and then pay off the debts that you have. Some higher paid specialties could very easily do this and then slash debt. That's what I would recommend if cash flow is not a major issue. So basically, see how much you can contribute to retirement accounts. It's important to at least get the match, and even better if you can fill it up while you're still paying off debt. In future episodes, we'll talk about how to really cut expenses so that we can increase the delta between our income and expenses and get our debt payoff rolling. Now for the second part of step three. It's time to make a student loan plan. I remember when I was a medical student, I literally avoided looking at the student loans I was taking out. (laughs) It was such a large sum of money, I couldn't stomach looking at it. But like most things in life, if we ignore it, it usually becomes an even bigger problem. Just the process of facing it makes it a smaller problem. So my friends, it's time to face our fears and see what our student loan situation really is. How much do we owe and to whom? What's the interest rate on the debts? If you haven't consolidated, you likely have multiple individual loans that you took out for each semester. You may have older FFELP loans or Parent PLUS loans in the mix as well. FFELP loans are federally backed loans that were originally funded by private companies. The FFEL program ended with the 2009-2010 academic year. The problem with these loans is that they don't qualify for forgiveness under the current repayment plans, technically. But you have a golden opportunity right now to make them eligible for forgiveness. More on this in a second. First, let's go over the different types of repayment and forgiveness plans so we can see how all of this fits together. I have a cheat sheet available to download at www.thefrugalphysician.com. If you're really trying to understand these plans, take a second to look at that. It summarizes everything we're going to talk about in one page. If you look at it while you're listening to this, everything will make a lot more sense. Big picture for federal student loans when it comes to repayment is that you can either stay within the federal system or refinance with a private lender. When you refinance with a private lender, that lender pays off your debts to the government and issues you a new loan, often with better service and better interest rates. But you lose all federal protections in case of emergency. A good example is how private student loans didn't get a pause during this COVID emergency while the federal loans did. 
Private refinancing is a good option if you have decided to pay off your loans quickly. You can make more headway if you're accumulating less interest every month. If you decide to stay within the federal system, there are several different repayment options available to you. There are three repayment plans that you have to pay off your loans in full. The standard repayment plan has you pay them off in 10 years. The graduated repayment plan starts off with a lower payment that increases with time and still pays off your loans in 10 years, but you end up paying a little bit more with this plan than with the standard repayment plan. The extended repayment plan pays off your loans in full in 25 years. So with those plans, you pay every penny fair and square. Usually, the federal system has high interest rates. The next category of federal repayment plans are the income-driven plans. These plans base your monthly payment not on how much money it would take to fully pay off your loans, but on your current income. And at the end of 20 or 25 years, depending on the plan, your loan repayment is done and whatever is left on your balance is forgiven. But it's important to know that the forgiveness with the IDR, or Income Driven Repayment Plans, is taxable. The forgiveness is counted as income for the year and you have to pay taxes on it when that's called a tax bomb. Except for right now. Due to the COVID emergency, the forgiveness from IDR plans has been made tax-free by the American Rescue Plan until the end of 2025. So that's an amazing opportunity. You don't have to pay taxes on this forgiveness until 2025 or the end of 2025. So the different IDR plans are IBR, which is income-based repayment, pay, pay as you earn, repay, which is revised pay as you earn, and income contingent repayment, or ICR. I know this sounds so like they're super confusing. Again, take a look at that cheat sheet and it'll be a little clearer. The specific details of each plan are in the cheat sheet, but here are the big things that you need to know. Repay is awesome because it forgives half of the accruing interest every month. So that significantly lowers the actual interest rate that you're paying on the loans. But the downside is it has no cap to the monthly payment. So all the payments in the income-driven plans are calculated based on your discretionary income, which is a formula that's listed on the cheat sheet. So with repay, it's important to calculate what your payment would be, taking into account your spouse's income as well. There are two plans that help you out if the standard repayment would be so high that it would be greater than 10 to 15% of your discretionary income. That's called partial financial hardship. And those two plans are IBR and pay. So again, you do have to prove partial financial hardship for them. IBR payments are 15% of your discretionary income, and they forgive your loans after 25 years of making payments. Pay or pay-as-you-earn payments are 10% of your discretionary income and forgive in 20 years. And these payments for IBR and pay are capped at the standard repayment, so you can't be paying more than what you would pay in standard repayment. You can also lower these payments by filing separately from your spouse, except for in community property states. Check the cheat sheet for those specific states. Finally, ICR, which is income contingent repayment, is 20% of your discretionary income, and it forgives in 25 years. It used to be good only for FFEL and Parent PLUS loans to make them eligible for forgiveness. Otherwise, it's not a great choice. Big picture with the IDR plans is that the goal is to get lower payments than the standard repayment plan and get the rest of your debt forgiven in 20 or 25 years, no matter where you're working, whether you're working for a for-profit or a non-for-profit. If you work for non-for-profit employers, you can qualify for forgiveness in just 10 years with the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. This program has seen some really positive changes recently. Before, when it was first implemented, very few people actually got forgiveness because their rules were so strict. But now the program has really made some positive changes and people are actually getting forgiveness. The PSLF program is great for doctors because we often work in non-for-profit hospitals during our residency and fellowship. To qualify, you have to work full-time for 10 years for a 50C3 non-for-profit employer and make 120 payments in a qualifying plan, which are the IDR plans. So ideally, while making fifty to seventy thousand dollars a year as a resident, you can get three to four years under your belt. If you do a fellowship, you can get another three to five years, and then you just need to work for a non-for-profit for another couple of years to get the tax-free forgiveness. Previously, this was really hard because government was very picky, but now that the rules are easier and the counts are more accurate, 
This is something you should really consider if you're going into a specialty that requires a long time in training. But if you're working for a for-profit employer, you can still get forgiveness with the IDR plans. In fact, you have a golden opportunity right now until the end of 2023. That's the IDR waiver. Especially if you've been in practice and have been making payments for many years already, the IDR waiver may be really beneficial to you. You don't have to wait for Congress or the Supreme Court to figure out if you're going to get forgiveness. You may already be eligible to get all your loans forgiven. If you consolidate FFEL loans with the federal government and enroll in an income-driven plan, you may be able to really benefit because there's going to be a one-time payment recount at the end of this year. Before, the payments that counted for IDR forgiveness excluded times that you were in forbearance, bankruptcy, or deferment. But sometime at the end of this year, there will be a one-time payment recount, and you can qualify for IDR forgiveness even if you weren't in an IDR plan for all 20 years, and now the time in repayment counts, any time in repayment, doesn't matter what plan you are in, most types of deferment will count, any time in forbearance counts, if it was at least 12 months long consecutively or 36 months long in aggregate, any month in economic hardship or military deferment will also count. So all of these months will be added to your payment count to qualify you for IDR forgiveness. And remember, this forgiveness is tax-free until 2025. So this is really a golden opportunity. Do remember that this is a government consolidation, not refinancing with a private lender. So you need to stay within the federal system to get the forgiveness. So a lot of older attendings that have been making payments for many years could really benefit from this waiver. Docs that had commercially held FFELP loans and have been paying since 1998 or longer should really look at this IDR forgiveness waiver. Younger attendings will get all the time the payments have been paused during the COVID pandemic added to their payment count as well. But like anything, there are exceptions to the rule. Not everyone would benefit from this IDR waiver and consolidation. If your income has gone up significantly and consolidation would increase your payments significantly, you'll have to do the math to see if the consolidation would be beneficial to you. Some FFEL borrowers have interest rate discounts, and those would be lost with consolidation. So make sure you look at that and do the math. I want to interrupt our regularly scheduled programming to bring you this critical update. See, I had these baby steps nice and lined out for you, clean and clear, but then the Supreme Court struck down President Biden's student loan forgiveness, so then the Biden administration struck back with the new save plan and modified many of the rules we went over in baby step three just a week or so after we released that episode. That's what happens. Unfortunately, that's the nature of the game. But this is really positive change for most of you that have stood alone. So I'm not sad about it. Also, it's really important reminder about how the personal finance game can change so quickly with changing legislation. That's why I'm here to comb through the details for you and bring you the salient facts that apply to you. So let's go over what happened on this release on June 30th, 2023. Big changes with the student loan repayment world. We went over the four IDR plans, or the income-driven repayment plans, that aim to give you lower payments and forgive your balance after 20 or 25 years. These IDR plans were income-based repayment, pay, which is pay-as-you-earn, repay, which is revised pay as you earn, and ICR, which is income contingent repayment. Repay was the most advantageous plan for most people because it forgave 50% of the accrued interest that was left over every month after your regularly scheduled payment. But it has no payment cap, so it can be disadvantageous for high-earning families. And we couldn't use the married filing separately loophole with repay to lower our payment. Well, now President Biden has changed that with a new safe plan. Repay will now become saved. Instead of forgiving 50% of accrued interest monthly, it will forgive all 100% of it. So that's awesome. Your effective interest rate will go down significantly. There's no cap to payment, but we can use the married filing separately loophole now to lower our payment as long as it works in our state. However, we can't use the switchback loophole. We used to tell people to switch back from repay to IBR before a big income increase, because repay has no payment cap. But after July 2024, you won't be able to switch from repay to IBR before a big income increase, if you've made more than 60 payments on repay. 
that's something to watch out for if you're going into a very high-paying specialty. Another piece of news. They changed the calculation of the discretionary income for SAVE. So discretionary income will now be calculated as equal to your adjusted gross income minus 225% of the federal poverty line instead of 150% of the federal poverty line that Repay was originally at. So that's going to lower your payment even further. Remember, discretionary income is important for calculating your payment. The monthly payment for undergrad loans will now be lowered to 5% of discretionary income and grad loans will be at 10%. If you have both, your final percentage will be a weighted average of the two. But that will mean a higher amount that will get forgiven. So anyone getting forgiveness after 2025 should plan for a tax bomb with forgiveness. That means you should have money sitting aside to pay that tax bomb when you get that forgiveness, at least for now. It's possible that that tax consequence may change in the future. Of course, it's not taxable until the end of 2025. After that, plan for it. If you don't need it, say they change the legislation and the rules, then you'll just have extra money sitting around. That's not a bad thing. Finally, if your total loan balance is less than $12,000, then it will be forgiven in 10 years instead of the regular 20 for undergrad and 25 for grad loans. That will be helpful to the community college attendees that have low student loans but may not make a big difference to doctors. IBR has seen some changes as well. The monthly payment will now be 15% of discretionary income on loans taken out prior to July 2014 and 10% if they were taken out after July 2014. The IBR payments are capped, but you have to prove partial financial hardship, or you can use that married filing separately, so there is some hope, but for high earning attendings, this may not be an option. The balance will be forgiven after 25 years if borrowed before July 2024, and 20 years if borrowed after July 2024. Pay as you earn will be phased out and will take no new enrollments after July 2024. Basically, pay will turn into IBR. And ICR, or Income Contingent Repayment, will only be for Parent PLUS loans to consolidate them and make them eligible for forgiveness. There used to be another move you could make to make Parent PLUS loans eligible for the SAVE plan or the repay plan. You could consolidate the Parent PLUS loans with one servicer and then send them to another federal servicer to be consolidated again so that you could then enroll in the repay plan. Well, that loophole will be closing in July 2025. So if you have Parent PLUS loans, now would be the time to do this double consolidation if you can. A couple of more changes. Deferments from unemployment, cancer treatment, and military service will now count towards the payment count for forgiveness and save. Certain forbearances will also count. Also, if someone is in default, they will be enrolled in IBR automatically. And if that calculates their payment at $0, they'll be out of default and then enrolled in save. Basically, this creates an automatic pathway out of default for those that may not know the rules. So a lot of positive changes for the general community. What does this mean for doctors? Well, basically, I think the SAVE plan will be beneficial to many, especially those that are in the lower paying specialties, but it may make things more difficult for very high earners. If going for PSLF, super high earners may be stuck with a high payment in early attending years until they can get their loans forgiven in that 10-year time frame. Or if not going for PSLF, it would make more sense to refinance to a lower interest rate, maybe, than make standard payments at 7 to 8% interest. So I've summarized a lot of these changes in the medical student loan cheat sheet for you, so it's easier to process. Make sure you check that out. Thanks for listening, and back now to our regularly scheduled programming. So in conclusion, you have options, and a lot to think about when it comes to a plan for your student loans. So that's why this is in step three. You can try to get forgiveness through PSLF or one of the many income-driven repayment plans. If you don't want to tie yourself down for 10 or 25 years and just want to pay your loans off, you can stay with the feds and pay off your loans through one of the standard repayment plans, or you can refinance to a lower interest rate with a private lender and pay your loans off quickly. Docs whose loans to income ratio is less than two to one are good candidates for rapid payoff. In other words, if your student loans are more than two times your family's yearly income, you may want to go for forgiveness. But if your loans are less than two times your yearly income, you'd be a good candidate for rapid payoff. That's what we did. My loans were one to one ratio, basically. And so we decided to just go ahead and get rid of them. And we did that in 17 months. 
So you have lots of options, lots to think about. This is the time to sit down and think about your student loans with your family. But isn't it nice to know that you have options? If you'd like an expert to go through your student loans with you and all the options that you have and all the caveats that you could use to really maximize forgiveness, there are student loan consultants out there to help you to make a plan for a fee. I hope this episode's helped clear up the murkiness of student loan repayment plans for you. Because you have so many options, it's important to consider your student loans and plans when you make your choice for your first employer. That's why we do this now in step three. Now for the quote of the day. Compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it, earns it. He who doesn't, pays it. Albert Einstein. That pretty much summarizes what we've talked about today. Get that interest working for you to build your wealth in an exponential fashion and make a plan for the liability of student loans to get them out of your life. The initial haul takes some work, but nothing comes for free. Good things take time and effort. The good news is that there are many ways to take care of your student debt. It just requires a little thought and planning. Thank you so much for those of you who have left five-star reviews for this podcast. Here's one from Pivot Points MD. Disha is an inspirational force in the financial literacy movement. As a physician, she cares for her patients' physical and mental health. As the frugal physician, she cares for our financial health. She is transparent and vulnerable with her story, breeding trust. Her blog is a valuable resource. Her podcast will be too. Go Disha. This is what I love about our online physician community. There are so many good people out there that are trying to help each other. Because happy and healthy doctors are good for our entire community. You all work your butts off to help those whose lives you touch. You deserve financial stability. We're all here to help you. And by the way, if you haven't checked out Bill and Becky's new podcast, Catching Up to Fi, you're missing out. They created this podcast to share their journey and help other late starters catch up financially. It's really great. And go ahead and take a listen if you haven't yet. So don't forget to leave us a five-star review on this podcast as well and spread the word. If you have any feedback, suggestion, or questions, you can reach out to me at thefrugalphysician at gmail.com, on Twitter at Frugal Physician, on Facebook at The Frugal Physician, or you can join our Facebook group, The Frugal Physicians. Now, a final word from our sponsor. At Pearson Rabbits, they understand that life can change in an instant. It's hard to imagine that a sudden illness, injury, or even worse, could put you and your family in a devastating financial situation. Visit www.pearsonrabbits.com today and embark on a journey of safeguarding your future. Because your story deserves a happy ending. It's time to say goodbye, but fear not. Finding Financial Freedom with a Frugal Physician will be back with more inspiration, knowledge, and money magic. Remember, the journey to financial independence is a marathon, not a sprint. Stay committed to your goals, continue honing your frugal skills, and never forget the incredible power you possess to shape your financial future. Until we meet again, keep embracing frugality and living your best life. See you later. The content shared on this podcast should not be taken as individualized financial advice. We are here to share our knowledge and experiences, but it is crucial to consult with professionals such as accountants, financial advisors, or attorneys who can provide personalized guidance based on your specific needs.